This will be more like a vlog kind of video. And uh, I'm shooting this from our basement for where you normally shoot my, my teaching videos and this is the, uh, the green screen. But I'm, uh, I'm not wearing my hoodie because I want this to be more of a, a conversational video. And the reason why I'm doing this video is that I've uh, been asked two interesting questions recently. And I thought that the answer to these questions might be useful for some other people beyond those who ask the questions. So uh, the first question was at the academic management meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, I was uh, one of the experts in the meet the quantitative expert session where people could come and go and ask questions from people who are supposed to know things. So normally people come and ask you questions like, why does not my structural legacy model converge? Why do I get this weird result from a factor analysis model? How do I deal with endogeneity in this kind of situation? But this time, uh, the first question that I got was not, not specific, but it was about uh, my opinion on what I think is the biggest problem in research methods and their application in management research. And um, I have lots of opinions about that, but I was thinking, why would someone care about opinions? But, but nevertheless, I find it flattering that someone cares about my opinions. And uh, I have an answer to that, and uh, the biggest problem is that uh, researchers, do, researchers do things that they don't really understand. So we apply methods and particularly analysis techniques that we have really no clue on what they're based on. And there is a lot of evidence that that's actually the case. You can see that when you take a, a general article that applies something that is more complicated than regression analysis or structural regression model, which is pretty mainstream in some areas, or general linear model, something more, more extreme, more, uh, more exotic, how that is often justified is that uh, this is what other people use when they apply this kind of problem. So uh, instead of trying to understand things, we try to mimic what published papers do. And that's, of course, a good strategy if you only aim for publication. But if you really want to get results that are, are robust and that are in some sense correct, then that's not ideal. Ideally, you would give a, a methodological justification for the things that you do, which, of course, uh, means that you need to understand, understand the analysis technique. So this is, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, a big problem. And I'm... Uh, in the process of writing an article about this, I call this a methodological crisis. And we go through our papers published in Journal for Process Management, where I was a methods editor for one term. And uh, we find that maybe one third of the articles published in that journal in, in the time frame that we took, it was between like 2015, 2018 or something like that. Maybe a third of those articles contain analysis errors that invalidate the results. So for example, uh, there were uh, one article says that they use seemingly unrelated regression analysis because they wanted to model uh, two-way paths in their model. Well, SUR can do that. So if you take a look at the textbook, any econometrics book tells you that that's beyond the scope of the, uh, the method. And if you want to uh, do reciprocal relationships, then you need to apply a three-stage least course or something like that. Another uh, favorite example of mine is an article that uh, I, I reviewed that uh, explained uh, how they applied two-stage least squares by taking the residual and, and using that uh, in place of the endogenous explanatory variable. Well, that's not how two-stage least squares works. And then, then I went and I checked the, uh, the cited reference. So that was citing uh, an article published uh, in the same journal by some other people. And that was citing an article uh, in SMJ that contained the same incorrect explanation. And then that was citing an article in strategic uh, organization that says that that article does not address two test discourse. So we have this problem of, of people using things that they're not fully qualified to do. There is lots of evidence that this actually happens if you know how to look for it. Uh, so how do we, we solve that problem? Well, ideally, we would uh, all be experts in things that we do. But to really like understand how you do our structure, ecosystem modeling, uh, properly and do all the diagnostics, 
takes a lot of training. And maybe you don't have the interest to do that training, or maybe you have other commitments, so you don't have the time to take the training. So uh, what do you do? My solution to this problem is to apply simpler methods. So uh, I've been telling for about maybe two years now that if you have a choice of a method that is 99% correct, but you're only 50% are li are likely to use that method correctly. And there's another method which is uh, only 85% correct, but you're 99% sure to apply it correctly. Always go for the simpler method because uh, the, uh, the risk of misapplying the complex method is a lot greater. The outcomes are uh, the outcome of misapplying that is a lot worse than applying the, the slightly suboptimal technique correctly. So this is the biggest problem. People don't understand what they're doing. And the solution is uh, to uh, learn more, but that's not realistic. And uh, the second solution is, is to keep it simple. If you use analysis technique, don't try to explain how it works. There is another uh, recent example from a postgraduate student that I have. And uh, we are working on a paper on meta-analytical structural ecosystem modeling. And there's this technique called uh, two-stage uh, SCM. And uh, how, how meta-analytical SCM normally works is that you take multiple studies, you aggregate correlations into one large correlation matrix, and then you apply SCM into that technique, in the matrix. But the two-stage approach combines uh, uh, all the steps of meta-analysis into a single analysis, so you don't actually construct that large correlation matrix. So, so uh, but he was really confused about it. And I was like, what's, what's the problem? You don't just, don't do the correlation matrix. And uh, then he pointed out to an, an article in Academic Management Journal that writes about uh, uh, these two-stage least squares and how they are in using that technique, first aggregate a correlation matrix and then do an SCM. But that's that's not near close what the technique does. So, so this is, uh, this is another problem is that uh, you might be applying the technique correctly, but your explanation is incorrect. So don't try to explain to people uh, how uh, statistical techniques or analysis techniques work, because then if it's published in AMJ or SMJ or Journal for Business Management, then people will think that that's the correct explanation. Just say that uh, you use two test list squares using status IVA regress command. Then uh, if someone wants to understand what that actually does, they can take a look at the IVA regress user manual, uh, the documentation in the state of user manual, which is great, by the way. So that's the first question, the biggest problem. And, and the second question uh, relates to, uh, this is an email that I got from a student who was asking, uh, asking for grades, uh, which are late for my uh, quantitative research methods course, uh, an advanced course, and then he was asking me, uh, how do I learn more about research methods? And uh, to give a bit of context of this question, this is uh, uh, this person, David. Uh, he has done uh, my postgraduate level introductory course, which is uh, a one semester course. So that's five credits. Well, it's probably more like 10 or 15 credits of work, but it's nominally five credits. And after that, he took my advanced course which is one year of, of, uh, of research methods training. So he had done a, a year and a half of training with me, and then he tells me, uh, how do I learn more? And uh, this is something that I haven't really thought about that much, because normally when uh, uh, someone asks me how to do, do you learn methods, it's a beginner. And I'll tell them to, uh, to come to my course, or I'll tell them to, to read a couple of good books, but if you have a person who has already read like 10 books and taken all the courses the university offers and wants to learn more, then my question really is that, uh, what specifically do you want to learn? Because uh, uh, once you know the basics, then it's not obvious what is the next thing that you should learn. For example, if you don't know regression analysis, and if you don't know factor analysis, you don't know anything about measurement, and you want to do a survey-based study, then the obvious answer is that you go for a course that covers these basic techniques. But once you go beyond the basics, there are so many different things that you can go, uh, you can um, expand to. And uh, I've been thinking about uh, 
uh, how to answer this question. And uh, I would ask the question back is that what do you want to learn? And I have some potential answers to that question, what the person might want to learn after they're already pretty good at methods. And then I have some answers to these, these different things. So the first thing that I have in my mind is uh, that you might be want to learn uh, more techniques. But then the question becomes, why is that? Do you just want to, uh, to say a list in your CV that you know 50 different analysis techniques? Unless you want to, be, uh, want to be a teacher who has to teach all this stuff like I do, or you want to be like an all-round uh, method reviewer, which I've done, then uh, if, if you're not in, in either of those two categories, then what would be the point in, in knowing lots of stuff that you don't use in your own research? And the, the problem is that like, if I know, let's say I, I know 50 different analysis techniques, something like that. So, so would I ever write article using all those 50 techniques? No, some of those are, are something that I would never use. So, so uh, I, do, I do survey-based studies, I do data-based uh, studies using uh, archival data, but some of these things like, like experimental research that, that I don't do, I would like to do, but it's very difficult to do in entrepreneurship. So uh, uh, research designs for analyzing experimental data and analysis techniques for experimental data is not that relevant for me as far as my own research goes. So, so uh, uh, if you want to learn more techniques, then just think like, what is the point? I would uh, instead think about learning more techniques as required. And this comes to my second point. So how do you, uh, the second thing that you might want to learn is how to learn, uh, to learn statistical analysis techniques and research designs more quickly. So, uh, so how do you, uh, how do you improve your skills so that you can just take a paper from, let's say, uh, a technical journal like structural ecosystem modeling or psychometrica and just read that, understand it in one go, and then go and apply that to your own, own research. And to do that, I see some value in learning more techniques. And, and this is one of the things that I haven't actually told my students who took my advanced course. We cover a broad range of techniques, and some of those techniques are they're used in management research, but they're probably not something that the students would ever use. The point is not to give them like a huge toolbox of lots of things, but it's rather to teach them many things so that they become more efficient at learning new methods, because that's what they will need to do if they want to be uh, on the edge of, of doing empirical research. So uh, the second skill that you might want to learn is, is how do you learn new analysis techniques more effectively and more efficiently. It is very easy to just read uh, one of these guideline types of articles or take a four dummies kind of book and then go and apply without understanding. Well, how do you really learn how to understand analysis techniques uh, uh, really on, on, a fun, on a more foundational level and also do that efficiently so that it doesn't take years of studying to do so? Well, I would say that there are two, two or three things that help. One is uh, to read good books on, on uh, fundamentals. Like, uh, I just got this book from uh, uh, an editor who's a, an editor of a paper of mine. So we got a revise and resubmit, and then the editor sent us a, a comment that we didn't understand. And then I, I emailed the editor asking him that, could you give us something that we can study to, to uh, learn more about this issue? And then uh, he sent me this book. And, and the book is about uh, how you tie with, tie those uh, things that we learn in a regression analysis class and, and GLM class and instrumental variables in econometrics. How do we tie those to the modern literature and based on analysis and uh, uh, causal structural models or DAGs uh, directed as Euclid graphs that Julia Pearl's work. So, so how do we how do we tie those? And that is very useful because it, it gives me kind of like this. Uh, it doesn't give me any new techniques. I know all the techniques that the, the book talks about, but it gives a different perspective, like how they can justify how they can be justified from the Bayesian perspective, and how they can justify uh, be justified from the structural causal models perspective. And uh, learning about these new perspectives is one thing. So, so take a good book. Uh, Judea Pearl's book on why is a uh, book of why. 
is something that I would also recommend. So that's not, not how you do things, but it's more about justification of the things that we do. Another thing that you can take is just to, uh, to pick up like an, an econometrics book. And it's going to be hard to read if you're not trained in econometrics. But it will, uh, going through it little by little, just take, take a habit of reading it, maybe two hours per week. And that will teach you how to read equations. And then that will help you to read uh, some of the, uh, the more technical research methods papers. So, so uh, read books uh, about fundamentals, uh, read more technical material. And then the third thing that I would like to uh, to, to uh, you to take away is, is the uh, usefulness of being able to simulate your own data sets. So whenever I need to learn a new technique, one example that comes to my mind is uh, these techniques for endogeneity that don't use instruments. So they don't use external instruments. They're called frugal approaches to uh, to instrumental variable. But for example, they use the uh, heteroscedasticity in the data as an instrument. So it's very hard to get your uh, head around the idea that heteroscedasticity might somehow be beneficial in dealing with endogeneity because they seem kind of like things that are not directly related. I, I took the paper and then I, I simulated the data set in Stata and then I tried to get the analysis to work simply using two stage least squares and I got consistent estimates under in, uh, endogeneity and I was pretty happy about it because I understood what the technique was about. Then there are also other techniques that are still kind of like on my, my, my list of things to learn. And one of those is generalized method to moments. I kind of understand the idea and I, I know the application pretty well. But uh, that is something that I still, whenever I have to have free time, I'll try to, to work through that myself, simulate the data set and uh, apply generalized uh, method of moments uh, just by using matrices instead of using the CAND command that Stata provides. So that is uh, and that third thing, uh, learn how to simulate. And um, then um, if you want to learn uh, a deeper understanding of the math or deeper understanding of how the analysis techniques work, then uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a problem because human learning how it works is that uh, you need to challenge yourself but not too much. So the, uh, the same thing, uh, I, I can give you an, uh, an example from weight training. So uh, if you want to learn how to, uh, to bench press 200 kilos, which is uh, something that uh, requires lots of practice years, you don't, you don't go to the gym and then uh, try lifting 200 kilos at the, at the same time, like right away. And uh, you go to the gym, maybe you bench press 50 kilos when you start, and uh, you don't go and you, you bench press 50 kilos year over year and hope that you get to 200. What's the trick is to, uh, to choose, choose something that you can barely do and then do that and then choose something that is uh, slightly more difficult. So uh, like you would do bench pressing, you would start with 50. Once you have uh, been able to do uh, five reps of 50, you go to 55. And then once you do five reps of 55, you increase again to 60. So there are different programs on how you do that. And after a few years, you eat the 200, if you eat well. The same thing applies to, to learning research methods. So uh, when I started learning uh, methods, I remember that I, I was the kind of a person who just took a software, then I read a four dummies kind of book and I, would ma I managed to do something with the software. And uh, I did some regressions and then I moved to structural regression model because I was able to uh, publish a conference paper with regression analysis, then why not go with SCM because that's what they are, all the cool guys are using. And then, then I did something uh, using LISREL and I got a conference a paper feedback. The reviewer told that the author clearly does not know what they're doing. And yeah, that was the case. I, I was following this kind of like cookbook approach without really understanding what I was doing. And uh, the model that I, I did did not make any sense if you understood what the model was about. So, so how did I then, then proceed? I, I, I started uh, reading a regression book by Cohen, Cohen et al. 2003, and that contained equations. And uh, that was really hard. So, so I had not read equations. I, I, I'm normally pretty good at math. So uh, in high school, I was pretty good at math. I did some math during the university, but I never liked statistics. So I got maybe like two or three 
from the probability and statistics course, so that's not my thing. And I'm trying to get my head around the equations was, was difficult. And then what I did was to start reading something else. So I read about applications that contain maybe with less equations. And then I, I started to eventually uh, develop my understanding of equations so that I could then take Cohen's book and read it comfortably. And, um, and then I realized that maybe this is not the best book. The same thing happened with, with uh, Woolridge's introductory econometrics. It was, or, uh, to, to start with, it was really hard. I had to struggle through the first uh, couple of chapters that contain equations. And then, then I saw those equations being applied elsewhere. So I read, for example, a uh, paper in Augustus Aristos Methods that applied uh, the same kind of equations, slightly different context. And then, then that developed my understanding and my ability to read equations. Then I came back to Woolridge and I realized that, well, this is, uh, this is a simple thing. And now I'm getting to the level where I, I might start reading uh, some part of Woolridge's proper econometrics book, uh, The Longitudinal and uh, Time Series Data, something like that. And uh, to, to read that pretty comfortable. Not all parts of it, but, but most parts. So, so you kind of build gradually your understanding. So pick something that you are, uh, that is slightly challenging for you, but not too challenging, and then just work through it, or maybe set aside two hours per week on reading that thing. And uh, then another thing that you can you can learn is uh, is is this these fundamentals. Like if you if you have a uh, a regression book, it tells that regression analysis has been proven to be consistent and unbiased. And some of these, these books contain proofs, and the proof might in, involve a normal distribution of the error term. The, the question then that you might have is, how would ever anyone come up with that kind of proof? And um, I'm not reading a, a book about one mathematical proof, it's, it's more for fun. Uh, it's, it's called Fermat's Last Theorem. It's not about uh, statistics or analysis, but it's just uh, how, how mathematicians come up with ideas. And uh, you might, might start to think about uh, how did anyone ever come up with regression analysis? How do we prove regression analysis uh, uh, unbiasedness? And uh, what is the normal distribution? How do we derive normal distribution? You can do that. But do it out of your interest. So, so uh, I don't know uh, I, uh, where normal distribution, how who proved it, and, and how its pro its properties are derived. And if someone gives me a proof that regression analysis is is consistent and is unbiased, I can read the proof pretty comfortably. But if someone gives me a, a, a clean slate of paper and asks me to prove that regression analysis is consistent. I'll just give the paper back to them because that is something that I can do. And you don't need to. So, so it's, it's, then it clearly becomes like, like uh, do you want to understand it? Uh, out of curiosity, understanding where the proofs come from is still probably not very useful for becoming a better researcher. And I talked with, uh, with a former colleague, Henry Stilt, about this uh, uh, the same issue, except in the context of philosophy. I had read some philosophy, and I was excited, and I told Henry that this is actually very useful. And then Henry replied back to me that you haven't read enough. So uh, once you uh, you reach certain point, then the things that you learn about might be really interesting. They might be intellectually challenging to you, but uh, ultimately, what you learn from these sources does not make you a better reader, a better researcher uh, in the way that you can actually actually apply them in your research practice. Then a uh, final thing that you might, might want to learn is uh, to use your software better. So uh, statistical software can be used in multiple different ways. I, I got some screencasts about it where I compare different uses. And uh, the, the way we normally start using software if we have Stata, or SPSS, which is not really a professional tool in my opinion. However, many people are uh, really productive with SPSS, but then data analysis is probably not their strong thing. Uh, so, so how do you? Uh, why would you want to learn more with the, with the software? The reason is is reproducibility and, and efficiency. Like uh, we have a paper that is now invited for third round in journal applied psychology. And we run like a hundred or so uh, structural equation models that are our variants of the same basic model. 
and uh, one co-author did the analysis, and uh, he did uh, the models one by one, uh, specified them using M+, then run it, save it, specify another model, run and save it. And that, that is a problematic practice for, for two reasons. One, it is error prone. So if you point and click or if you type, then uh, the risks that you do something uh, that is different between models is, is real. And second, it takes a lot of time. So learn how to automate things and, and how to do a little bit of programming with your statistical software. And uh, this is uh, something that you can, you can learn by, by doing. You can just like, if, if you decide that you want to learn how to do reproducible tables using Stata, you would pick up the Stata's uh, collections and, and tables manual and then uh, work through that and learn. But the, the real question here is, is how do you force yourself to do it? Because it's a bit tedious to learn about these techniques, even though it pays off in the long run. And my, my recommendation on that is that, that uh, make rules for yourself. So make a rule that you will, uh, you will never type a single uh, regression table in your life. And then every regression table, regardless of how complex it is, must be produced by exporting from the software. And when you set these challenges to you, then it makes uh, it increases your skill. Then you can move on to have different kinds of tables to do with that software. So, so uh, uh, build these habits of, of doing things in software that you could quickly do manually. And ultimately, your uh, uh, level of efficiency with the software increases so that it becomes actually faster to do it with software instead of doing it manually. So I have uh, these, these four things that you might learn, more techniques or, or designs. And uh, this you would, I would recommend that you do this only because uh, learning more techniques helps you to learn to learn. And uh, then, but there's a, a small caveat here. If you want to be something, uh, to, uh, come up with clever analysis designs and research designs so that you can be someone who publishes something uh, in your field as the first person ever. Uh, I have uh, one tip for those people that I got from John Antonakis, and uh, he comes up with these clever research designs, uh, particular experimental designs, and I asked him, where does he come up with all the ideas of doing this stuff? And he told me that he reads uh, science and nature, so he, he takes a look at what they do in the real sciences, and then uh, well, he reads those at, at, uh, in his bed before going to bed, and then uh, he gets ideas by, by looking at the other fields that are even not related to us. So if you do an experiment, uh, how would you uh, apply that same design uh, to your own discipline? And uh, deeper understanding of math, uh, the same applies to deeper understanding of, uh, of the actual estimation method. So when you uh, estimate a model, like maximum likelihood on a computer, then that is numerical optimization. You can, you can do a PhD degree on numerical optimization. It will not make you a better researcher. So uh, once you understand it on a certain level, like you understand what is a Hessian matrix, what is a gradient vector, and how they're related to the estimation, then understanding the optimization algorithms Beyond that, probably not very useful. If you want to do it as a hobby, if you like doing it, it's intellectually challenging, then go for it. But don't think that that is uh, something that uh, makes you a better researcher. Uh, and then the final thing was the use of so software. Just uh, force yourself that there must be a way of doing this so with software. Like I have uh, uh, two figures that I want to uh, want to combine uh, using Stata. I, I published a paper earlier this year about uh, uh, model, uh, similar about uh, transformations and nonlinear models, eight, eight guidelines, something like that. And we talk a lot about visualization. And what was a real learning experience for me was to do some visualization with Stata first and then try to reproduce the exact same visualization with R. Because the built-in visualizations, they look, don't look the same. And uh, sometimes in Stata, you have a built-in visualization that plots one curve, and then I wanted to plot another curve there. So of course, I could have just done two curves with transparent backgrounds and put them on top of one another uh, using uh, some graphic software no one would have noticed. But then again, uh, pushing myself to, to do it all in Stata and all in R instead of, of doing anything by hand, 
help me to become more proficient user of this software. You can take a look at the R code and state code in the appendix of the article. It is uh, open access. I'll link uh, the article to the video description so you can you can get it from there. And it's pretty advanced R and state code and some cool tricks that I learned during that. So uh, then. Uh, some, some practical things that you can do to improve yourself. And, and one thing that I haven't really uh, touched on yet is that how do, you, how do you learn about the current practices in your field? So uh, the social science uh, and management within the social science is a social process in, in the sense that uh, what we think is, is publishable and, and good enough, rigorous enough, it is kind of like a, a contract between researchers. So there, the researchers. So there is no like like uh, reason to say that let's say p is uh, more than 0.5 is is not pub, uh, not a result. P is less than 0.05 is a result. So that's just kind of like an agreement or standard. The same thing uh, we have agreed in management that if you don't know uh, what is the functional form of or between x and y then uh, align, with, align will do if, if you have no, uh, no reasons to believe otherwise. So there are these, these agreements and these standards within your field and it varies between different fields. I recently talked uh, a couple of months ago, I talked about talk with an epidemiologist and uh, their standard for causal claims was that if uh, two things are correlated, then we can make, make a claim that there is causality and then it's up to others to disprove it. And that wouldn't fly in management research, but it flew. It is how some people publish in, in high profile journals like, like Nature. So uh, to understand the conventions and understand that the problems of, of methods in your field, uh, I, would, I would say that uh, becoming a method reviewer in a good journal is one of the best things that you can do. So, so I run the method review process for journal of personal management for about three years. And I did most of the papers myself, but I also trained some students using those papers. And uh, I know some of those methods editors, and uh, I, I know that there's a shortage of people who are skilled on methods who want to, uh, to review papers for their methodological correctness and completeness. And if you volunteer and you can make a credible case that you actually know what you're talking about, then uh, that is going to be very attractive for, for these journals, like any, any good journal. So I, I know that, uh, for example, uh, a leadership quarterly has a pool of method reviewers. Uh, the Journal of Management has a pool of method reviewers. Journal of Operations Management is building one. Uh, entrepreneurial theory and practice uh, used to have some kind of method review at least. So, so these, these uh, journals have pools of reviewers. So if you want to get involved, you can just email an editor and ask, and then, but that requires that you're actually good at what you do, and then that will make you even better. And um, yeah, and I, then final thing, what do I do to, to learn a method? Well, if I really want to learn something like, uh, how do you do uh, lagged variables? This is something that I learned last year. I uh, agreed to do a course where I teach lagged variables, and then that gives me a deadline for learning how to, uh, how to model these dynamic models, dynamic panel models, how to, uh, how to interpret results when lagged variables are present. And uh, that when you are able to, uh, to teach something, explain something to somebody else, then uh, that help, uh, helps your own learning. So even if you're not uh, like running a course for doctoral students, uh, you can, you can uh, have a colleague. So if, if one of these, uh, if you're learning a new method uh, uh, for a paper, uh, that you're writing with a, co with a set of co-authors, tell the co-authors that you run half a day workshop about that method for them. And when you start thinking, how do I explain things, things to others, then that really uh, uncovers your hidden assumptions. So you might assume that you know something, but when you start thinking about how do I explain this, this thing to somebody else, then that really reveals if you have really understood it in a way that is, is fundamental enough that you really are able to teach it. So, so these are the things uh, that, I, that I would recommend. So, so as, as, as just, just go and, and study new things, decide what you want to learn, uh, do method reviews, uh, try to teach some principles to others. Like if you're a third year doctoral student, uh, run a, a class on first year students. This is actually something that I started with. So I was a doctoral student, 
and I wanted to teach my colleagues how to do SEM. Of course, I did not, not teach it the way I would do, teach it now, and I would probably, uh, uh, my, my current myself would probably tell my, my past myself from 10 years ago or so that, that you don't know what you're talking about. So that is uh, one thing, read widely, not only your own field, but other fields of entry computations. Uh, read resource methods journals like Orgasesa Resource Methods. It's a, it's a great resource for learning what new things are uh, available. And also uh, there are articles that point out some perhaps problems and misapplications of, of the uh, current things that we use. And then you can also learn about those. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, these two questions that I had were, uh, what is the biggest problem? The biggest problem is uh, that people are using things that they're not qualified to, uh, to use or they don't understand how they work or what assumptions they're based on. And then uh, the reviewers are equally ignorant about these methods. Often, not always, but often. And the second question is that how do you learn more about methods when your basic understanding is already uh, uh, pretty robust? So, so uh, simulate, learn, challenge, uh, read challenging stuff, become a method reviewer, and then uh, start reading these more applied uh, method journals like organizational resource methods, and then uh, psychological methods, sociological methods, and research. These are probably the three most relevant ones for applied researcher in management disciplines. So uh, thanks for watching. And uh, uh, we have the green screen up. We have, uh, I and my wife, we're both recording stuff for, for uh, uh, courses and then will be, uh, there will be some, some more, uh, maybe 15, 20 uh, short lectures coming on, coming up in the near future.